Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Hello, we welcome you to the bridegroom cometh. I'm glad to have you with us once again today. I'd like to invite you to write us this week. Our mailing address is Post Office Box 508, Hillview, Kentucky, 40219. My wife, the Reverend Della Kirk, will be coming in just a moment to bring us today's message and music. But first, I'd like to read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was a candlestick and a table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was a golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them under the time of reformation. But Christ being come, the high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise they have no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God had enjoined unto you. More was he sprinkled with blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding the blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto him that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now here's my wife Della with today's message and music. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. 
precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily, His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. There is wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Aren't you glad that the story of Jesus isn't a myth? Aren't you glad that the power that's there in the blood of Jesus is not a myth? Because how do we know it's not a myth? Because we've experienced it in our own heart. We've experienced it in our own soul. How do we know the power of the Holy Spirit is not just a myth? How do we know? Because we've experienced it ourselves. We've experienced Him within. We've experienced Him within. We've experienced His leading us from within. We've experienced Him. And so we know it's not a myth. But before we could experience Him, guess what we had to do? We had to accept it as true before we had the evidence. We had to accept the story of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the dead, from the grave for, our, for, for us. We had to believe it before we experienced his power. We had to believe the stories of Jesus, how he was the Son of God, how he came from heaven, how he came down here and lived a sinless life, and then went to the cross and paid the sin debt for us on the cross, shed his blood, and water and blood flowed out of his side to cleanse us from all sin. We had to believe that and receive him as our Savior as the Savior of the world. We had to receive Him personally. We had to receive Him when we hadn't seen Him, when we hadn't experienced anything, but we believe it to be true. And we reach out and we take it and ask Him to save us. Just believe Him, even though we don't see, and that's faith. When we reach out and we believe and we receive it, and we receive Him as our Savior, and give Him our life and commit our life to Him as make Him Lord of our life. And then we begin to experience. We start as a newborn baby in the spirit, just like we do as a newborn baby in the physical body. And then we start to live our life for Him. And as we start to live our life for Him, we experience Him in our daily life, in our walk. And we experience His, we experience his joy, when we experience His peace for saving our soul. He wipes our conscience clean from all the sin, from anything we have bad conscience about. He cleans us up, our mind, He cleans our spirit, and we become pure 
in position in him. We become his child. The scripture that Tom was reading here uh, about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. I hope you'll study the little book of Hebrews because it's, it teaches you the difference between the Old Testament law and our New Testament covenant in Christ Jesus. That's by grace. That is by grace. That's by what he did for us. In, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, it says in verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry Moses had done in the Old Testament. Sprinkled the, the vessels in the temple and, and, uh, and everything in the Old Testament had been sprinkled, the, the worship instruments and everything. But Jesus came and it says, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood of the Lamb they had shed in the Old Testament that would represent the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God who would come one day and shed his blood for us. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. See, even in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament law, there was no remission of sins, there was no remission, no canceling of sin, no pardon, no just no, nothing without the blood of the Lamb being slain. For their sins and that was a type like i said of jesus the lamb of god who would come one day and shed his blood for us and it says it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these and see these things in heaven this was a type of what was going on in heaven god had told moses you set everything up just like you see it is in heaven you set it up according to the pattern you see in the, up there and it says, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Christ is not now entered into the holy place made with our hands. See, they put together a temple back there. They put together um, things but in here we, we build churches, we build walls. But the Bible says that Christ is not entered now into a place built with hands, our human hands. Guess where he lives? He ascended back to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us. We are his temple now on earth. And, and he sits on the right hand of the Father and business goes on between him and us all the time. And so the Bible says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. We have a lawyer standing before God the Father in heaven for us. He is our advocate. Uh, he is our perpetuation for our sins, our substitute for us. He's our Savior, He's our Lord, He's our attorney in heaven. When Satan tries to accuse us and says, but you can't do the ministry because of something way back there, somebody made some gossip up and made something worse than it was, or whatever in anybody in minister's life or anybody else's life, you say, well, we, uh, so that minister over there, he really did fall in sin. But you know something? I'm sorry if he did. But you know the devil is the accuser of brethren, so he loves to go around making things even worse than it was. And so you don't listen to the devil. You go ahead and keep your eyes on Jesus and living for Jesus and working for Jesus, okay? And you don't let the devil stop you with all the accusations, all right, that he tries to put out there to try to hinder your ministry or to try to hinder you as a Christian. And so it says here, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus is standing in heaven in the presence of God the Father for me, for you who believe in him. That's why the scripture says, If God be for you, who can be against you? Don't listen to who's against you. Don't listen and be weighed down with burdens and refuse to serve the Lord because 
of what you've done in the past or because of accusations against you in the past. Because then the devil wins. He keeps you shut up. He keeps you from fulfilling your purpose in life. What if you were meant to be an Esther? What if you were meant to be able to speak up and save your people? Like Esther was in the book of, uh, where she was um, used uh, for the Jews. Just a poor little girl that had grown up and ended up becoming, uh, becoming in the palace. And right at the time when she was needed to save the Jews. What if she had refused to speak up for her family, the Jews? What if she had refused to take her stand with them? She was in the palace. She was very good. She was a beautiful lady and she'd been chosen for the king. What if she had chosen instead to put them down and to make them look as though they were nothing and as though they had no sense and that they were not worthy of life? What if she'd chosen to go along with the wicked people of that day and had not stood with her people, the Jews? What if she had chosen not to fulfill her role in history because of fear that she would lose her position in the kingdom, for fear that she would lose her palace? What if she had chosen to stay on the side of the devil accusing her people, the Jews? But no, Esther stepped forward. And Esther prayed and she fasted for three days. And then she came before the king, knowing that her life could even be taken for coming before the king if he didn't receive her in what she said. Because she too was a Jew. Do you know there are people I'm talking to today? You're a young person perhaps and you're a Christian. You've received the Lord. And you're ashamed and you're trying to, to, to ride the fence. And you're trying to have one foot in the church and Jesus and one foot in the world. And you don't realize you're in the world because you're not doing anything bad out there in the world. But you're just not being bold for Jesus and not being bold with his people. And you know something? The Lord would say to you today, you're an Esther. And if you don't stand strong with your people, if you don't stand strong with the Christians, it's the same as not being a Christian. It's the same as just not serving the Lord. No matter how hard you work doing something else. You have to stand with your people, the Christians. You have to stand like Esther. Esther was a beautiful lady. That's why she was in the position she was in, because of her beauty. Because she'd been received because of her beauty. But you know, the Bible says that beauty fades away. It says our life is like a vapor. The Bible says in Psalm 37 that we wither away. That we wither. The Bible says we're like the grass. We're cut down like the grass. Life is short. Life is short. We don't live long. And it's important that while we're here, that we always stand up for what is right. That we stand for the Word of God with our families. That we stand for the children of God. That we stand for the people of God. That we stand like Esther did for the Jews. That we stand for the right values and stand for the God's people and with them. And so, young people, don't be afraid to stand up bold for God. Be an Esther. Be a Daniel. Daniel stood up for what was right in the king's court, even though he knew that he could be killed. When the king gave the decree that nobody was to, to pray to the king, to, to pray to anybody but the king to know God, Daniel still prayed to God, and he didn't obey the voice of the earthly king, but he prayed to God. All right, and God stood with him in the end and gave him the victory. Whatever the price is, even if there was a price down here, Jesus said, fear not him that can kill the body, but fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. All right, remember that when we're in Jesus Christ, when we've received him as our Lord and Savior, that we're to be faithful to confess him to the end, to the very end of our life. There's a lot of people today, they've said they believed, they've said they've been baptized, and yet they are turning their face away from the Lord. 
turning their face away, turn, refusing to speak up for the Lord, not wanting to be counted with the Lord, trying to be a secret disciple, thinking that you can be a secret disciple. Now Jesus said, if you don't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father which is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father which is in heaven. So we have, uh, if we're going to do what's right, we have to be one of those that stand with the right, stand with the Lord and stand with what the righteous values are because the Word of God says that we will be judged according to our confession of faith and according to the life we live. The Bible says some people will receive the reward of unrighteousness, unrighteousness, because they have not lived a godly life. They will receive the reward of unrighteousness. We don't want to receive the reward of unrighteousness, do we? So the Daniels out there today, the people that are having to decide whether you're young or whether you're a grandma, no matter what age you are, if you're grandma, you've got to stand for what's right in front of your children. Remember, it's like that Daniel having to stand for what was right before the king, like Esther having to stand for what was right before the king for her people. You've got to stand for your Christian loved ones in your family. You've got to stand with those that are taking their stand for the right values and for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you think you're just going to keep your mouth shut and you're not going to say anything, then you're not being an Esther. You're not being bold. You're not being more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Your children and your descendants would depend on you being faithful to the Lord. Their very soul is at stake because they will, they very well may only do what you say. And if you don't stand for the things of the Lord and serve the Lord yourself, and if they don't see you serving the Lord yourself and doing spiritual things for the Lord themselves, they won't see any need to do it themselves. So it's important for us to serve the Lord with all of our might. The Bible says that whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all for the glory of God. So it doesn't matter if you, if, you, if you work hard at something, if you don't give the Lord glory in it and praise in it, and you don't uh, let the young people see that, that you give the glory to God and, and you thank Him for all things, and that you let them know the right way to go is through faith in Jesus Christ. Then if you're silent, and I've seen too many people that have lived for God, they said, and they've lived, worked hard, and yet they're silent when it comes to the Lord. They're saying, well, I know all that. Well, I know all that. Well, if you know it, you're accountable to tell it, not just know it yourself. You have to stand up for what is right. And that is not just, you know, trying to argue or trying to, to um just be mean-spirited and, and cut certain people off in your, you know, situation in your family. But it's, it's acknowledging the Lord in front of your family. Acknowledging the right things in front of your family. All right? And so we want to remember that we want to dare to be a Daniel. We want to dare to be an Esther. Yes, we do. Women, let's dare to be an Esther. Let's dare... Let's dare to go on ahead and, and stand for the Lord in a spirit of love. Not in a spirit of, of anger, but in a spirit of love. All right, let's just be bold in letting our children and other people know which side we're on. You know, I've learned you don't have to do it in a real forceful, hateful way. You just let them know which side you're on. It's important, grandmas, that you let them know whose side you're on, you're on God's side, and you're on His value side, what He says. You're on the side of the Holy Word of God. You're on the side of, the, of, of walking in righteousness. It's, and, and, and brothers and sisters, you know, it's important to let your brothers and sisters know what side you're on, on the issues of today. On the issues today, it's important to let them see your light shine for Jesus and for the right values. All right. <clears throat> there is power in the blood. There's power in the blood to reconcile families. 
there's power in the blood because when you're all in one spirit in Christ together and you're all in the word together and you're all then you'll begin to all see things alike together in like spirit doesn't matter you see what I mean uh, whether you live in the same town, same town or not same city or not you have this in common you have the word of God you have Jesus in common together you have his hymns of praise together if you will learn these hymns and sing these hymns and maybe you already know them but then you've got the hymns that you can sing together you've got the word of God that you can sit down and you could have a devotion together in front of the family and it'd be a good thing before your children and your children's children when you get together and you have a big family meeting I mean, you don't, you should have a meeting and have it long enough so you have time at the beginning to have a song of praise where everybody sings, have a, have a time for a scripture devotional where the people know that they're to do that and they do it together. To set that as an example before the whole family, everybody, all the brothers and sisters and cousins and everybody that comes together so that they see that our heritage is that we have honored the Word of God and that we've honored His precious hymns, that we've honored His songs. Or if you have a spiritual song, if a young person there has learned a spiritual song they want to sing, let them sing, but have a time to lift up God. And then you will see that the rest of the meeting will flow better in the Spirit of God because there's victory when you put the singers first, when you put the Lord first, the Word of God first. The Bible says to put Him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, His right values, His right way of living, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so when we do that, and we do that in our family meetings, when we can do that in our family meetings, where we can have that time together, then we know that God is going to be there and help us to flow together in the right spirit in a family. But if you have somebody in your family that tells the children and tells everybody, oh, don't let them say anything to you. Don't let them get into the Bible. Don't let them say anything. You know that's the devil working to keep disunity in the family. You know that's the devil working to keep us from growing in Christ together and growing in love together. So who is it? that doesn't want us to uphold the word when we're together? Who is it that doesn't want us to be able to sing his praises together? Who is it that doesn't want, that doesn't want you, Grandma, to be able to pick up the Bible and read something and explain it to your children? Who is it? Who is it that if you start to do that, you feel a resistant spirit come? Who's that from? That's from the evil one. That's from the devil. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. God bless you for listening. God bless you.